All right, so we're coming to the end of 2023. I think this was my best year ever on earth. Uh, as I'm getting older, life's getting better. And, um, but this year was filled with lessons, right? Good, bad, ugly. And I just wanted to kind of give you this unedited, pretty unscripted version of a recap of the year. Highs, lows, lessons. Um, it's been an amazing year. I've made more money than I ever have in my life. It's been incredible. Traveled the world, uh, more connected with my wife, my kids and all those types of things. Um, but there are lessons. And so I've written down 10 of my biggest lessons in 2023. And I hope it's helpful. So we're going to start deep. Uh, no messing around. No talking about kind of the, the lighter, fluffier stuff of life. I want to go right deep into my biggest lesson because it started in January of this year. And the lesson is this. You can't outrun the pain of your past. So end of last year, in 2022, um, I'd spent the year traveling the world. Uh, business was going really well. I traveled to 11 countries, uh, most of those with my family, all over the place. Lived in LA uh, for six months, lived in Mexico for five months, went to Paris, Dubai, Fiji, New Zealand, Australia, all over. And it was really interesting because I massively simplified my business in 2022. And I was feeling so stressed in that year. So I assumed that was the source of my stress. And I simplified the business. I was working eight to 12 hours a week. The business did about $2 million last year. Life was pretty good. The problem was I wasn't feeling very good. And I wasn't sure what that was. And long story short, I really realized that there were some things that happened in my childhood, things throughout my upbringing that I needed to go back and revisit with key people in my family. You know, just the light, fun, exciting stuff. And so real talk, like I was... Um, going to be flying back with my family to New Zealand at the start of this year for Christmas and New Year's. And I, I realized at that point I couldn't do it. It was like I had to face all of these different things. I don't know if I was ready to face it. Long story short, my family's in New Zealand. I'm in Singapore. I'm on this like eat, pray, love journey. What's going on? What's Dan, what's Dan up to? And Because I was dealing with all this stuff that I, I couldn't really put my finger on and couldn't identify. All I knew is that there were some more important conversations that I was putting off and felt scared to confront. And... Long story short, I flew from Singapore uh, to New Zealand on New Year's Eve. We're literally middle of the year and everyone's like, Happy New Year. And I'm like flying across the oceans, land in New Zealand. And I just line up conversation after conversation with family members. And I don't know if you've ever done that before. Uh, it's not easy. It's not fun. Especially if you're talking about things that you should have talked about decades ago, but you didn't. Uh, but that was me uh, that week, just lining up all these conversations. And... Without going into detail, because obviously uh, I'm not the only one involved in these conversations, um, it was really powerful and really hard. Um, but when those conversations happened, I realized that I had confronted things that I'd been running away from for a really long time, and I couldn't outrun them any longer. Like they were, they were there, and unless I chose to deal with them, confront them, talk them through, figure them out, they were going to be with me for the rest of my life. And something really powerful happened. I had these conversations and firstly, I was in some of these conversations talking about things that happened when I was 10, when I was 11, when I was 15, when I was 18. And it wasn't like I was able to solve those things. We couldn't go back and teleport and fix it all. But simply me talking through it uh, with the people that were involved brought healing, brought a sense of closure. The conversations, uh, some of them went well. <laughs> some of them I had to do like round two. <laughs> it was like the first conversation was like a bit of a disaster. And the second one was like, you know, got better. But my lesson here is like, we all have things that are affecting us from our past. And, and the challenges for many of us, they live in our subconscious. And so it's not even easy to figure out exactly what we have to do and what we need um, to do to fix it or to bring healing or to bring closure. But one of the things that I've understood, at least about my way that the universe works, that God works, is that when you commit to the path of healing, you may not have all the steps. You may not have all the answers and all the things you know to do, but oftentimes you have at least our next step to go and do. For some of you, this lesson, uh, if you were to kind of take my lesson and bring it into your world around not being able to outrun the past, is maybe it's like start therapy. You never done therapy, you never had a psychologist or a counselor, like maybe that's the first place to start is to talk out parts of your past that you've maybe never done before. Tools for me that have been really helpful is things like breath work, walking, journaling, uh, meditation. Those things have been incredibly helpful. But that's been a huge lesson for me that 
out, outside of that, I don't think this year would have panned out the way that it did because when I left New Zealand and I hopped back on that plane, my whole life wasn't fixed. But I had felt like I had drawn a line in the sand and finally dealt with things that I realized I could not outrun no matter how hard I tried. And by doing that, I had a greater sense of courage and confidence going into this year that really impacted even the way I was able to show up in business. So that's lesson number one. You cannot outrun the pain of the past. We must confront it head on. Number two, and this is, again, keeping on the theme of deep stuff, we've got to identify our unhelpful patterns. You know, this is really interesting as an entrepreneur and working with a lot of entrepreneurs. I've worked with over 800 different clients in the online space. Everyone has unhelpful patterns, and some of them are obvious, and some of them are not so obvious. And one thing in particular that I see is people will self-sabotage themselves at different levels of growth and success. So I had an amazing question from a one-to-one -one mentorship client uh, a couple of weeks ago that I loved, I've been reflecting on. He said, Dan, every time I get to kind of thirty to $40,000 a month, I sabotage myself. It's going well, it's going well, focus, simplicity, you know, awesome. And then I just go and start something new or do something new. And throughout a conversation, it was really fascinating. He said that, when he was younger, his dad made a lot of money and he was terrified, uh, sorry, his dad made a lot of money and then his dad lost it all and it devastated their family and his dad never financially recovered from that. And there was this internal story for him that if he made a lot of money, he might lose it all as well. And so he didn't want to make a lot of money beyond that kind of threshold that he felt really comfortable in because what if he lost it all? What would happen if he got to 50K a month to 80K a month to 100K a month, but then he dipped back or he lost it all or something happened in the business? And it was creating this pattern in him of self-sabotage. And what's really interesting for me is I've become so disciplined in my personal, uh, sorry, my business life over the last few years where I don't really struggle with entrepreneurial ADD uh, and self-sabotage in the obvious ways like I used to or like many people do where things are going well and then you, you know, create chaos. But one of the things uh, that's been a pattern for me is my upbringing especially was very chaotic. Stress was the natural environment I lived in. And so when I wasn't feeling stressed, I actually felt worse. Stress was familiar to me. It was familiar territory. So when business was hard, I weirdly felt good. And so when business felt good, I, like, I actually felt really terrible. And so one of the things that I realized was that I would create chaos for myself to feel normal again. I needed that sense of adrenaline, that sense of cortisol. And so one of the things that's been a pattern for me for the last few years that I think I'm much more aware of right now uh, and definitely reining in much more is I would just have this instinct to like change things up, move houses, move countries, hop on a plane. Like there were moments last year where it was like I was in Mexico and life was so cruisy, right? No business stress. I'm working eight to 12 hours a week. Lifestyle is amazing. And I would start to just feel so uncomfortable because of how comfortable it was, if that made sense. And so I would say to my wife, oh, I'm, I'm thinking like I take our son Brooklyn, who's seven, who was six at the time. I should take him to London next week. Like that sounds amazing. And then, you know, I go off and do that and I, I feel normal again because we're in a new country and it's kind of like a chaos of travel and things like that. And this lesson of identifying unhelpful patterns has been so incredibly insightful for me because everything starts with awareness. Until you can become aware of the patterns that are holding you back, you will never be able to change them. And so through that practice of, again, whether you talk about breath work or meditation or walking or journaling, that process of reflection and awareness becomes so crucial to identifying these patterns. It's not until you become aware of them that you can actually change them. And that was one of the biggest lessons for me this year is I'd been living in the consequences of decisions that came from patterns that would happen in cycles. It wasn't like every day I was doing this, but every couple of months I was doing this and it was creating chaos. But the chaos was coming from my inability to live with the peace and the quiet and the stillness. And that's where the pattern was stemming from. And so for you, I think it's about really becoming aware of those things so you can get ahead of them and start to deal with them head on as opposed to being 50, 70, 80. And I promise you, these problems don't go away. These patterns don't just naturally change over your life. You have to change them actively by addressing them head on. And so this was uh, kind of the second biggest lesson for me this year. Um, the third biggest lesson comes from 
I don't know if this is Homozi quoting someone else, but this is something I've heard Homozi say, which is the heaviest weight to carry is an unmade decision. So end of last year, I just felt unhappy in business. And I just sat with that for a few months and I didn't really know what to do. And so many of you know my story. Last year, I, I um, or 2021, we made $2 million. Uh, 2022, we made $2 million. But 2021, we had a team of 13. 2022, I had a team of four. So I was like on this path of simplicity and it was going really well, but I still felt unhappy in the business. And I knew I had to change things up, but I was like scared. I was frightened to like let the team go or to start a new offer or to kind of launch a new direction. And it was that unmade decision that was actually worse than the process of walking out what I knew I eventually needed to do. And so at the start of this year, I let everyone go and it was just me and a part-time VA. And I'll never forget the feeling of the night before all of the rest of the team finishing. And I talked to every current client and I said, hey, what you bought into, I'm not doing any longer. This is what I'm doing now. You can leave, no hard feelings. If you wanna stay, this is what it looks like. And everyone but one person stayed. And the night before my team finished, I remember just this feeling of relief. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm moving in the direction I wanna be moving in. And at that moment, I didn't have all the clarity of A through Z of what I wanted it to feel like and look like. All I knew is I'd made the decision to burn to the ground what was so I can step into what could be. And that feeling was amazing. It was courage. It was confidence. I felt abundant because my expenses went way down. And that feeling um, is something I wish upon everybody. But most of us stay in that unmade decision. And the heaviest weight to carry is that sense of, I should be doing this, but I'm not doing this. And sometimes it's on the other side of a hard conversation. Sometimes it's in the middle of the leaving the job that you it feels comfortable and safe and familiar and starting the business that feels scary. For some of you, it's like being in the business and actually realizing you're not an entrepreneur. Or you don't wanna be doing this. And it's actually making the hard decision to leave that behind and going and finding a comfortable job. And there is no right or wrong here, except what is right and wrong for you. And one of the biggest lessons I've learned this year is just that valley of indecision, of sitting with decisions that we know we need to make and we're terrified to make is one of the biggest uh, weights that we could ever carry. It is, it is excruciating, uh, at least how I would describe it. And we don't get through it until we make the decision. We draw the line in the sand, we close the door, we open the door, we walk through it. And I just think that's been a huge lesson for me this year and uh, I'm sure it will continue to be because uh, big decisions are typically not easy to make, um, but the worst place to stay is in the valley of indecision. So that's uh, number three for me. Number four, no one wants to follow a lost leader. You know, that was an interesting season for me, not making the decision, not really knowing what I was doing with the, the coaching program and the team and things like that. And so it's funny because you're showing up to like team meetings and you've got no vision. And you don't know where you're going and you don't know what you're doing. And uh, man, that can last for a day or a week. Um, the team will give you some grace. At some point, they're just gonna stop following. And this was really interesting for me because I've always really valued my ability to be good with people. And so I can kind of BS my way out of a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> so even when I'm not knowing what I wanna do, I'll still take action, I'll still work with people and go, this is gonna be amazing, it's gonna be great. Uh, but people can sense the insincerity or the lack of conviction in that. No one wants to follow a lost leader. And so if you are lost right now, uh, you know it's not as easy as me saying, hey, go find yourself, create a vision. But it is understanding that you have a limited runway, that if you have employees, team members, even in relationship, if you've got a spouse and you're freaking living life wandering aimlessly. I mean, literally, I spent last year just wandering around Mexico. It was kind of hilarious. People will only be able to give you so much grace for so long before they need you to lead again. And sometimes this just starts with the decision to just work with what you know. And the piece for me connected to what I said last point around letting go of the team and all of that was I had to work on the information I did have, the vision I did have, and when I did that, all of a sudden I got to lead again. I, I had a sense of vision. I didn't know what I wanted the business to look like forever, but I knew what I wanted to look like for now. And I think stillness is a big part of this. Actually getting still and asking yourselves the questions, you know, what season am I in? What's the theme of this? If this was a movie, 
what category would it fall into? Is this the comedy, the drama, the romance? Like what season am I in? What's the purpose of this? And when we get still, we are able to reconnect to what is most important right now. And until you do that, you will be the lost leader who's trying to show up to team meetings or show up to client uh, calls and, and have all the enthusiasm in the world, but people will be able to sense your lack of directionlessness or your lack of direction. And I think one of the best gifts that you could give yourself is to reconnect with a sense of vision, reconnect with a sense of why. And sometimes it's simply going back to what motivated you to start this in the first place. What motivated you to, to, to take step one, to launch the program, to start the business, whatever it might be. It's this utterly overwhelming understanding that you can only lead without vision for so long before you're actually leading no one. And instead, you're all lost in the mix together. So that was a really big lesson for me this year. And um, in any season of my life, I've been at a point to when I've had really clear vision, everything is easier. Momentum is easier to build. It's easier to get clients. It's easier to lead team members because everyone likes to be uh, in a boat that's going somewhere, in a car that's going somewhere. No one wants to sit and stand still traffic while the driver's trying to figure out where to go. And I think that's a, a great analogy for life. It's a great analogy for business. And that was a big lesson for me this year is um, I can't just take my time to figure it out when people's lives or livelihoods are on the line. Um, I really need to stay reconnected or connected to the why behind everything I do. So that's our lesson number four. Lesson number five is really my two favorite words when it comes to growing businesses, which is that simple scales. When I let the team go this year, uh, this was like kind of February, March. I did what a mentor did for me in 2021. So I worked with uh, someone that has a nine figure net worth. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and he personally coached me. And our cadence was big call at the start, get clear on what's working, what's not, what are the opportunities, what are the key projects to move forward, and then two 30 minute calls a month. Now, this might sound insignificant and basic, but that's what I committed to with this new model is I didn't know the fancy new cool coaching program and direction I wanted to take. All I knew is I loved the clients that I worked with and I needed a simpler model to serve them that didn't take a ton of my time that was scalable, but that would also get them amazing results. And so I transitioned the kind of program I had that was like five support calls a week, stacks of modules, stacks of new content, all of these bells and whistles. And I just reconnected to the simple model that a mentor walked me through in 2021. And when I did that, I was able to scale up to $95,000 a month in profit in 86 days. And it was simply that. It was like two 30-minute calls a month. There was a Slack channel and there was some modules that people could reference from the past. It blew my mind how I was able to make money, get clients, retain clients, get them amazing results with a model that simple. And what happened over the next few months is then I outgrew that one-to-one. -one. I maxed out my capacity. So then I launched a group coaching offer and it was half the price. There was no one-to-one -one with me. But again, everything was so simple. And I think I enrolled 25 clients in 21 days into that. And then more than a client a day for like five or six weeks. And again, the whole simplicity of the model floored me in terms of the way that it worked. And so you know, I'm rounding out this year about a million dollars in profit and my super complicated funnel this year has been a Facebook profile plus a YouTube channel. Hello. <laughs> and, um, and two offers, a mentorship offer that's two 30 minute calls a month or a Slack channel now in, in, in some cases and a scalable offer, right? A group coaching offer that has no one-to-one -one with me. And that simple model has worked so insanely well. And so this is something that Anytime I think back to the best seasons of business, it's never complex. I never have 17 offers and 35 funnels and I'm posting everywhere all the time, all at once. It's when I come back to the basics. And so one of the things that I really want to challenge you to think about as you're rounding out this year is maybe this year has been amazing for you. Maybe it's been filled with challenges. Maybe it's been one of your worst years in a while. Whatever it is, I'm not projecting, just kind of sharing the kind of spectrum. I want you to think about the seasons of your life where business was easiest. What were you doing at those times? What were, what were you doing then that you're not doing now? What are you doing now that you weren't doing then? And one of the key things to come back to this simple scales model is to simply repeat successful actions, to come back to 
what worked in the past and simply do that and do that more and do that better. And I can't tell you how often I work with clients and they're struggling and the key to getting to the next level for them is just doing what they used to do and then doing that more and better. And they're like, oh, you know, I used to do like monthly workshops. I'm like, why don't you do that anymore? Uh, I'm not sure. I got bored or I don't know. I got low attendance on my last call, so I didn't do it again. Then they bring that back in and all of a sudden they're like, and so it's simply coming back to that simple model of doing what has worked for you in the past and or doing what seems to be working for other people, but fighting off the complexity to maintain the simplicity. So that was a big lesson for me this year. And, you know, next year as I look to scale up to two to three million a year, um, I'm going to keep things as ruthlessly simple as I possibly can. There's a great book on this called Essentialism. Uh, and that's been on my mind all year. There's another book called The 80-20 Principle. Again, all of those things come down to the fact that most things do not matter. Most things are relevant, but there is a vital few that if you commit to them and you do them well and you do them often, things will go well for you and you'll create massive momentum in your business and in life. So that was lesson number five for me. Lesson number six is something that's taken me a long time to understand, which is that you almost never exceed your goals and your intentions and your expectations of life. So start of this year, I set my sights on a million dollars in profit. Now I had done a million dollars in profit in previous years with bigger teams and crazier models. This year I wanted to do it in a very elegant, simple model. And you know what's weird? I'm rounding out this year at right around what I set. Now I haven't finished out the month, so I'm either going to be just under a million dollars in profit by, you know, you know, 20 to 30,000 or I'm going to be over, whatever it might be. But isn't that crazy? I set a goal nine to 10 months ago of a million dollars in profit and kind of here I am arriving at that. Now, why am I not at 2 million in profit? Because I didn't set that goal. And there's something so interesting about how kind of life gives you what you expect of it. Like if you notice that the people who are the most pessimistic and the most negative and expect life to be terrible for them and think they have bad luck, often have really bad luck and have really bad things happen to them, right? We get from life what we expect of it. We get what we ask, right? What you seek, you will find. And one of the things that I am constantly trying to challenge myself with in the next year especially is expanding the vision of what I think I'm capable of. Like right now, I'm so grateful for the year that I've had, for the life that I'm living. Like it's unreal. I understand how fortunate I am. I'm sitting here in a studio in Bali, living in a holiday destination. Like I'm crazy fortunate. And I'm also so deeply aware I'm living so far under my potential. And I don't mean that in a bad judgmental sense, like I'm being hard on myself. I understand how much more I have in the tank, how much more I'm, I'm capable of. But I will never exceed the goals and the intentions and the expectations of my life. So I need to constantly expand what I believe I'm capable of. I need to set my sights beyond what I've experienced so far. And this is why, and I'm going to get to this soon around environments and relationships, while why exposing yourself to different environments and getting into different relationships and different networks and different friend groups and different coaching programs where people are thinking bigger is so important because it expands your vision of what you believe you are capable of. And this has just been a huge lesson I've reflected on this year that you will never make more money than you believe you are worthy of, you believe you're capable of. You don't just accidentally double your income, right? That Those are the rare stories, right? Those are like the lottery moments where for most of us, we can't relate, right? We're making exactly what we believe we are capable of making. Um, and so I think there's been a big, big lesson for me. And uh, this is something that I'll continually be thinking about coming into 2024 is if I want to make more than I've ever made in 2024 um, up into this point in my life, how am I going to expand my life and my vision and my expectations and my intentions. It's not just going to happen naturally. It's not just gonna be me sitting around singing Kumbaya and kind of attracting that into my life. It's me exposing myself to environments and relationships where um, I can be challenged constantly in that. Number seven, build skills that pay the bills. I am so freaking grateful that I spent the first few years of my business going hard into marketing and sales. And now I have experienced a level of mastery in this. And what's hilarious is I think I'm pretty average at both. Um, I have so much uh, room to grow in both of those. But 
I'm decent, right? I can write copy, I can shoot these videos, I can jump on a sales call if I ever needed to, though these days I don't. I can coach clients, I can build charisma, I build charisma, I have charisma to build rapport with strangers. And those skills um, are very, very valuable. Like I think about some of the connections I made this year, some of the deals I've closed, you know, about 12 months ago, I broke a huge ceiling in my belief um, by closing a $100,000 deal. But all of those are built off of skills. And I think this year, it's been just this continual refinement of the skills that I have. When I sit down and write a post on Facebook, I'm not just trying to write the same type of post I could write 12 months ago. I'm trying to get just that little bit better, that, that like kind of 1% better mentality. And I think like if I could give any piece of advice based on the lesson that I've lived out this year, especially when it comes to making money, it's build skills that actually transfer into real world value for other people. Because when you learn to do that, when you learn to market for yourself or market for someone else, when you learn to sell for yourself or sell for someone else, when you learn to work with people and they're your clients or they're someone else's clients and you're a coach, whatever it is, those skills are so insanely valuable. And so whether you're thinking about starting your own business, growing your own business, just adding way more value to the company that you're in right now, really be thinking about what skills will add more value to the people I work with or work for. And when you really get clear on those skills, you open up kind of this uncapped earning potential that I think I've just found so true in my life that every layer or every level of earning that I've had, the next layer is always unlocked by better skills. And so in 2024, that's something I'm thinking a lot about is really identifying what core skills. And the cool thing is, is you don't need 270 skills, right? There are a couple of core foundational things that if you were to focus on them, you would be building skills that pay the bills and your future self will thank you so much for the work that you're doing to develop that right now. Um, number eight, and I briefly touched on this before, is the importance of environment and relationships. You know, this is unpopular to kind of crap on the place that you grew up, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, New Zealand is an uh, interesting place for me. And I think I spent most of my life feeling like an outcast in the country I grew up in. And I don't mean that from the way that people were treating me. It was so much internal. People were, people were amazing. New Zealanders are incredible. I just didn't fit my DNA. And whether that is a spiritual thing, right? I have no idea whether I just listened to way too many Americans growing up, which honestly, that could probably play a good part in it as you live in New Zealand and you listen to basically people who are not New Zealanders, you're going to have a cultural conflict. Leaving New Zealand in 2021 was the best thing, or at least top five decisions I've ever made in my life. Now, I'm not telling you to go leave your city, but what I am saying is your environment shapes the person you're becoming almost more than anything else. And so if you think about it from a uh, simple understanding, right? We have a house and you can be in a terrible house with no natural light and it smells like mold and um, it's uninspiring and you can have terrible furniture. Uh, and, you know, we did our season of that for sure where, you know, people are like giving us secondhand furniture. And I remember one person, uh, this is hilarious, side note. Um, I remember a person tried to uh, bless us, which is what you do for like poor uh, church people is like you have other people who like have means and they're trying to like give you stuff. I um, mean, sometimes that works amazing. Thank you, generous people. And sometimes it's terrible. And I remember one time we got uh, dropped off a couch set and we were like, this is amazing. Uh, and then we like look at the couch and the couch is like filled with um, holes because rats had been eating it in the storage container. And so you put that in the lounge and you're sitting on what was rat infested couches. Like, how do you feel? Like, where is your self-worth? Where is like, like, where is your mindset when your lounge and the only couch you have to sit on, like you hit it on the side and there's like rat poop that fills out, like drops out. Like that's graphic. But my point is, is that your environment, the things that you interact with, forget even the country you live in, has an effect on your psyche. It has an effect on who you are, who you're becoming, what you believe you're capable of. And the moment I left New Zealand, it wasn't like I left behind this cruel, terrible place. But when I stepped into Los Angeles, for example, everyone was thinking bigger. Even just the city. I, I went from living in, in a city of 130,000 people and really on a peninsula of like 40,000 people to uh, Los Angeles, where I think Los Angeles County is like 14 million people. It instantly challenged me to change the way that I thought. 
And then alongside that, getting into rooms where I was paying $60,000 a year to be in a mastermind and I'm sitting there and I feel like the poorest person in the room, but all of that challenged me to level up my game. And then connected to that, you know, I have uh, a lot of really good friends. One guy in particular is a guy called James Kemp. And he is one of my best friends. Uh, we ironically, not, not totally intentionally, but a beautiful kind of coincidence. We live right next door to each other. Like we literally share a fence. And we have caught up two to three times a week for a year. And when we lived in different countries, we would talk on the phone for hours. It was almost like podcasts that should have been recorded, but were just conversations between two friends that were sharing ideas and challenging each other and encouraging each other. And that relationship is a great picture of how relationships have served me in the past. We, of course, sometimes we just have friendships, right? There is just people in our life we grew up with, we went to high school with, and there's not like a ton of value added. You catch up and it's like, hey, how's your family? Great. How's your family? Great. I'm not talking about those relationships. I'm talking about the relationships where you are challenged to be a better version of yourself. And one of the biggest lessons for me this year is that we are not designed to do life alone. This doesn't mean you need 27 friends. It doesn't mean you need to be throwing dinner parties every other night. This That might not be your personality because it surely isn't mine. But I am more convicted than ever about the importance of continually maintaining really close friendships with people who inspire me, who challenge me, who encourage me, and who force me to become a better version of myself. And so as I'm thinking about 2024, I'm taking those lessons with me. This is not like 2023, leave it here, I've learned it. This is like, how do I continually refine my environment so it supports me and my goals? And then number two, how do I surround myself with people that not only I get something from, but that I can give something to? And if you were challenged in how this year turned out for you, I would encourage you to look at those two areas, your environment, where you live, like what that looks like, the city, the culture, all of those things. And maybe it's time to get on a plane and get out of there. And number two, who are you doing life with? Are you serving people? Are you contributing? Are you being challenged by the people that you're spending time with? One of the tools that I've always used is number one, you can simply tap into a better uh, network or better mentorship by changing the kind of content you listen to, right? But number two, I have forever and always believed in the power of paying to be in bigger and better rooms. So few months, and I mean, literally three weeks into our business, I was on a plane from New Zealand to San Diego to go to my very first mastermind. And right away, that leveled me up. Then a few months after that, I joined my first uh, year long mastermind it was $25,000. I didn't even know how I was going to make the second payment, but I just figured out a way to make it work. And being in that environment where people were making in a week what I made in a year, it challenged me to level up. And mentorship has played such a crucial part for me. But this has been a huge lesson that I cannot overstate the importance of environment and relationships and those two things directly affecting the quality of your life and your level of momentum. Number nine, you never arrive. This is like kind of been depressing and encouraging. Um, I've, I've got three amazing clients recently. Like I have all amazing clients and I truly mean that. I got rid of all the non-amazing clients a long time ago. I've enrolled in the last few weeks uh, a YouTuber with 2.2 million subscribers with an incredible kind of cult-like following. Uh, I've uh, got a client who has billions of streams on Spotify and you know one of his hit songs has 1.7 billion views on YouTube and if I mention it you would probably know what it was and then number three I enrolled a client who um, just sold their company for 255 million all of these people could have a sense of they have arrived right if you think about the YouTuber he's got more influence than you know, a hundred humans could accumulate over a hundred lifetimes, right? In terms of when he records a video, how many people listen, the influence that he carries. I was just thinking and kind of flawed about kind of working with these people, these really high caliber people at how committed all three of them are to personal development. Like if anyone could kind of sit back and relax on the previous successes they had in the life that they've built and the person they've become, it would be these people. But they are so committed to growth, it is brought me into a reality check of I will never arrive I will be 80 I will be 99 on my deathbed God willing right and I'll be reflecting on all the ways I still suck I mean hopefully not too depressing but like there'll be so many areas of my life I know I will still continue to need to grow in even up until my last breath because we never 
arrive. You never just conquer a problem and then it stays conquered for the rest of your life. You never get to such a point of success where you don't need to grow any longer. You will never, never, ever fulfill your potential. And that motivates me. And I think this was a great reminder for me um, you know, this year because I, I make more money than really anyone I know back home in New Zealand. And it, there's this great sense of like, I could just camp out here, never grow my business ever again, stay here, just try and maintain it for the rest of my life. And I would have reached kind of peak success in the lives of other people, but I haven't arrived, nor will I ever. And I think that's been a big lesson for me to kind of reflect on this year that I want to keep pushing the envelope of what Dan Bolton is possible and, you know, keep upgrading like those iOS, uh, you know, upgrades that we get on our phones, you know, iOS 16.57, I want to be Dan.75, Dan.83, Dan.9, all the way till I die. No settling, no stopping, never arriving, always growing. Number 10, and this has been a really cool theme for this year, is fun is underrated. It's so rare to meet people who do things these days just for fun. Everything has to be so productive. We go to the gym and we push hard so that we can look a certain way, but we're also doing it listening to a podcast, so we're working on our mind. And then we're parenting our kids, but we're terrified of screwing them up. So we're trying to do it in such a way that like they become amazing humans and we protect them from trauma and we like give them the absolute best childhood they possibly can. And you think about it, any realm of like human life and human endeavor, we take things so seriously to the point that everything now has to have a purpose, right? We're trying to minimize the pain, we're trying to maximize the pleasure, um, all under the guise of kind of this productive mindset. We were trying to get things done and grow. And one of the things that I have reconnected with recently, um, really throughout this year is like, I can do things just because I wanna do them. Like I can change my business just because I want to. And I can do this because it's fun. I don't have to have a reason. I don't have to like carefully plot this out and figure out how this works in my 25 year strategic plan. I can just have fun and I can just enjoy and I can take things a little less seriously. And even though I have crazy ambitions for my life and I know I'm put here for a purpose on earth to help people and contribute to humanity in a certain way that does not mean every waking moment of my life I need to be like this, freaking out about how I can be better and do better and get better I can actually just slow down and have fun. And um, that is ironically made me way more money this year. When I've optimized for what I love, what I enjoy, um, even stuff like this, content creation, it's like, how do I make this fun? Like, I don't just want to sit in front of a camera and like talk about crap that everyone else is talking about and do it because I have to do it. What do I do or how can I do this in such a way that I want to do it, that I, that I feel like I get to do it? I feel like this is a privilege, this is an honor, this is a joy. And this has been a huge lesson for me this year. And so I know this has been like a rambling, ranting kind of episode and video. I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, honestly, this list could have been 50 things. It could have been 100 things. I, I feel like I've grown so much as a human being this year and, and not in all the positive ways. I mean, I've experienced incredible growth and also like there are areas in my life I'm really excited to tackle and work on in 2024. But I hope um, these lessons or at least one or two are stuck out for you and I would highly encourage you to at the end of this year to really reflect on the year that's been. Even if it hasn't been the year you wanted it to be, what areas can you celebrate? What lessons can you pull from this year into the, the next year? It's been a rhythm that I've had for years uh, in terms of end of year reviews and things like that. And I highly encourage you to do your own version of that. So anyway, I'm sending you so much love. I hope this has been helpful and I'll catch you in another video.